Hi everybody, good morning, it's Tony Lewis. Um, I'm Head of Policy at CIEH. Welcome to the uh, CIEH Air Quality Webinar. And basically we're saying we're looking at air quality because it's our view and we've stated it on numerous occasions now, what we're looking at is standing at the edge of a public health emergency. Just to give you a little bit of, of, of information, um, if you've got questions and we hope you've got questions, um, please use the question box in the panel um, at the side of your screen to ask those questions. Um, we'll then collate them at this end and we'll deal with the uh, questions in a Q&A session at the end. You're also going to um, be faced with um, some polls. So we want some sort of instant responses um, from you in, in relation to a, a number of questions. And the very first of those polls is on your screen right now. It's very simple. Um, we ask a question, you indicate using the panel on the right hand side um, what your response is. And then from all the people that, that, that are, are responding to this, we get a, a, an overall uh, bar chart that's produced so that we can see how people are, are, are voting. It takes about 10 seconds or so. So let's kick off with this first one just to see, just to get a flavor, just to get you used to using the panel on the right hand side. And simply what we're asking is, are you satisfied with uh, the government measures to deal with nitrogen dioxide? Simple, yes or no. So if you could click on your screen and start voting. And um, what we're starting to see is that people are doing that. And um, immediately we can see that, that um, we've got about, what? Well, oh, it's varying a little bit. Give or take 65% who are saying no. 30% um, not sure. That's uh, that's interesting, with a 7% a resounding um, yes who are satisfied. Um, that's equally interesting. And, 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 for the, and for the yes voters, I'd like to really like to know um, um, where your, um, what your views are on that. Perhaps you'd like to state those views in a, in a question that we can deal with at the end. Um, that would be particularly interesting. So it's finalized that 6% said yes, 65% said no, um, and then 29% uh, uh, not sure. That um, is, is interesting. The 65% who are saying no, um, not satisfied with government measures, I think um, I certainly would concur with that view. And you know, you, I'm not gonna sit on the fence here as head of policy at CIEH. I very, very firmly take the view that what we've got here from government um, in, in relation to the whole air quality issue at the moment is an abdication of responsibility. Um, uh, but I'll come back to that as, as we go through this particular web webinar. So let's, let's move along um, and just very quickly scope the, uh, the emergency itself. Uh, because I've said, you remember, that, that I think that we are standing on the edge of a public health emergency here. It's the line we've been consistently taking. Um, in, in, in press, in media, um, dealing, with, um, dealing with members, dealing with stakeholders. And the reason that we're saying that is who, whichever way you look at this, whoever's um, statistics you want to look at, whether you're wanting to look at stuff from DEFRA, whether you want to have a look at um, stats coming out from Public Health England, there is give or take a, you know, a few percentage points in terms of confidence of results generally we're all saying the same thing and what we're all saying is that we're looking at, at around about 40,000 premature deaths per year in the UK due to poor air quality that um, colleagues friends and, and, and interested people who are sitting at the other end listening to this this webinar is like taking the um, the Olympic Stadium West Ham Stadium um, and filling it and saying that all those people in there potentially um, could be dead by the end of the year due to air quality. That's the, the scaremongering side of it, but the numbers are significant. What we also know is that um, air pollution currently costs business and indeed healthcare services somewhere on the order of 20 billion pounds per annum in the UK alone. So, you know, if you are in government, it would seem to me, it would seem to CIEH, if you're in government and you are dealing with a situation where there is 40,000 people a year dying prematurely, whether the, co where the costs to the state, um, its healthcare services and its businesses 
are somewhere in the order of 20 billion pounds a year, then we are looking at something that is significant and something that needs to be addressed. Um, and quite frankly, what we're looking at here is that moving things along, it is um, time for change. Simple as that. That's what we're saying. That's what CIH is saying. It is time to change. This is not acceptable from an environmental health, from a public health, from a financial position, um, from a, any perspective. This is not acceptable. So it is time for change. And so we're going to move on and look at some of the stuff that, that we here at CIEH um, and I don't just mean here in this building sat here in, in, in central London, I mean the entire organization, and we'll come on to that in a bit, but what we in CIEH are, are saying, what we in CIEH are doing around this particular issue of air quality. But before we do that, um, time for another quick poll. So we're really getting you used to using these polls at the moment and getting you a feeling of uh, confidence of using the panel on the right hand side and then perhaps as we go through you'll get be sufficiently confident at some point to ask questions but okay so you, you're looking at another of the poll questions that's up on your screen right now and again simple answer yes no and so what we're looking at has has too much responsibility been placed on local authorities to sort out air pollution it's too much responsibility being placed on local authorities to sort out air pollution. So if you want to have a look at that, look at your panel on the right hand side, click your response and we'll see how it goes, see how it develops over the coming seconds. And in about 10 or 15 seconds when the, when the voting levels out, we'll, you should be able to see um, how it's gone. And so we can start and then pull it together. So what I can see at my end at the moment is that people are voting and what we're looking at is that that um, has too much responsibility been placed on local authorities. Yes, this is a national problem, 26% say, and requires national solutions. Only 2% are saying that local authorities are best equipped to deal with it. Surprise, surprise. And we got 17, uh, 72% who are saying that, that, that uh, it should be a partnership approach that's required. And again, um, it would seem to me the good sense of, of, of people logging into this webinar certainly reflects my view. Um, and um, we got 96% of you out there who voted on this particular, uh, on this particular uh, uh, poll. So well done to that. I hope you're getting used to using the idea of, of, of the, uh, the panel on the right hand side. And, and please feel free to post questions as they come to you and as we go along. So moving along then, um, I said just a few seconds ago before we started the poll, what's CIEH been up to um, in relation to air quality? Um, and I think it's first important to say that, that, that as an organization, um, over the last six months or so, we've significantly changed the way that we deal with key issues, key policy issues. And we've changed that um, to make sure that we now fully involve all our members, all our members, um, and give everybody an opportunity to play a part in policy development and indeed what will then follow, and that is campaigning. So um, we've done a whole bunch of things in, in, in relation to air quality, um, but what we've done, the primary thing that we've done is around engaging with you, engaging with members. And we've established an air quality advisory panel made up of you, the members. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a few moments. But as, alongside that, what we've also established is um, an air quality community. So. Hopefully, all of you who are logged on to this particular webinar today are, are members of that community. If you're not members of that community, then um, before we're done in, in this particular webinar, I'll tell you how you can do that, how you can become part of the community, how you can play a part. But what else have we done well, over and above establishing an air quality advisory panel and community? Well, um, those particular members who got involved have been involved with us and they've developed, they've worked on, we've collaborated and we ended up publishing an updated policy statement on air quality. That's 
the very first thing that we did. We set out our stall on what we think are the current issues of concern, and indeed we set out our stall on what collectively we see as our priorities. So that's not people here in this building doing that, that's all of you, the members, doing that. So this is policy on air quality that is made by members for members, so it's members in effect setting the agenda in relation to air quality. In addition, um, collectively we've joined the Healthy Air Campaign Coalition and that Healthy Air Campaign is calling for a new Clean Air Act and again I'll talk about that um, in, in a few moments time. And we've also become um, a member of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Air Pollution, the APPG, and the All-Party Parliamentary Group is, as its name suggests, uh, a, a, a group that is based around Parliament that takes its membership from all sides of Parliament, so you, it is an opportunity for us to join a group that works directly with parliamentarians, and hence we've got the opportunity to influence around this issue of air quality. And finally, one of the big things that we've been doing is that we've got members um, involved in assisting the Chief Medical Officer, Dame Sally Davis, to uh, compile her annual report for 2017. And that annual report for 2017 is going to focus on pollution. So we've got people doing all of those things at the moment. Um, but I said to you that um, we would move along and that, that we'd um, look at the air quality advisory panel and the air quality community. And so um, just a few moments from me, if, uh, if you like, about a few words from me about that. Um, what is the air quality advisory panel? Well, the air quality advisory panel um, is about a, a panel of 20 members of this organization who um, threw their hat in the ring, contacted me and said, yeah, um, we've got something to offer um, in terms of being able to advise CIEH on policy development, on campaigning around air quality. So that panel met first of all in um, February. Um, it's working exceptionally well. Um, people are engaging in conversations both in meetings and outside of meetings. Um, and they are coming, they are advising CIEH on lines to take, directions to go in relation to air quality. In turn, the advisory panel is supported by a wider community, and I mentioned that a few moments ago. And that wider community is a community of simply interested members who feel that they may be working in, in air quality, um, that they may have an interest in air quality, but they too want to be supportive of CIH, not only supportive of CIH, but to get something out of that support from CIH to maybe do some development for themselves, to learn from themselves, to engage with others around the country um, in, involved in, in air quality matters. And that advisory panel at the moment has been working, as I said to you um, um, uh, earlier, working on a whole bunch of things. Um, they've been as I say, developed and published a new air quality policy. Um, they've also been involved in the production of the CIH election manifesto. And I suppose um, I should have put manifesto in inverted commas because it's not a manifesto per se. What it is, is a set of priorities that we feel are important and which we've ensured is on the desks of ministers as they've taken up their new ministerial posts. Those are the things which we've said are important for us. And surprise, surprise, air quality um, is, is on there. And indeed, as I say, our um, air quality community and indeed the um, air quality advisory panel have had a role in helping us to produce that. Um, similarly, the advisory panel has helped us put together a, a response to the government's consultation on NO2 and is helping us to do so on, on uh, another consultation that the uh, Treasury is engaged in at the moment, uh, HMRC is engaged in at the moment in, in, in relation to red diesel. Um, but today is National Air Quality Day. Today is the day um, when responses to the government's um, consultation on its strategy to deal with NO2 um, have to be submitted by. And our advisory panel has been working um, 
beavering away very, very hard to get hours put together. And that submission was made yesterday um, to government. And if you want to see if you want to see that submission, it is available at the moment on the CIEH website under the policy resources um, section, I believe. And um, you can you can see it. You can click on it and, and have a look at it for yourself. Um, and the members of the air quality panel have also, as I said earlier, been attending a whole series of, of, of meetings on air quality with uh, Public Health England, with DEFRA, um, with the all-party parliamentary group. Uh, they've been doing a lot of great work on all our behalfs, frankly, uh, and, and they're to be commended for, the, for their diligence on this. So that's a little bit of background about how we've been, how we've been doing stuff. Um, in, in relation to air quality. Um, I want to get on to, to substance in, in, in a minute or two. Um, I want to encourage you again, if I may, to, 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 to be brave enough to, to pose questions. So feel free to do that. And um, whilst you're maybe thinking about um, questions that you'd like to pose and things you'd like to discuss, then here's another of those, of those polls to have a go at. And um, simply, has the government focused too much on NO2 whilst overlooking the issue of particulates? That's the next poll. Has the government focused too much on nitrogen dioxide whilst overlooking particulates? And again, just as before, you've got the boxes on the right-hand side. And again, what we've got there is um, people voting right now. Um, the numbers are rising. And the options that you've got are no, NO2 is key, and it should be a government matter. Yes, NO2 is one problem, but there are other aspects. And then um, finally, a bit more attention towards particulate matter is what's called for. So as the voting you know, continues, give or take another 10 seconds or so, we'll round it up and we'll give that feedback to you. So yeah, please feel free. Be brave, vote on this one. Um, we're up to about 45 people who have voted at the moment. So good on you, please carry on. And um, we'll get a result as soon as possible and then start to move forward. But uh, if you've voted already, please feel free to, to think about any questions you want to pose on any aspect of air quality, on any aspect of how CIEH is involving itself on air quality, or indeed any comment that you want to make perhaps in relation to what government is doing or not doing, or indeed suggestions that you might want to make that we should be doing, our air quality advisory panel, lines that they should be pursuing. All of those are possible. Use that, that question box on the right-hand side to do that. So where have we got to then um, on that particular question? Then again, we've got a, a, um, a split there of 67% um, saying, yeah, um, NO2 is one, pro, uh, one problem, um, but uh, we need to look wider. 18% are saying no, NO2 is key. And 15% um, who are saying a bit more attention towards particulates. Um, again, interesting. You may have some views on that. But uh, whilst you're thinking about that, let's move forward. Let's move on. Um, I said I wanted to, to, to look a little bit more about substance and um, to air quality. And I want to spend a few minutes, if I may, focusing on the government's um, consultation um, on its air, NO2 strategy. You will recall that the consultation was literally dragged out of government. They were almost kicking and screaming, but it was dragged out of them um, as a result of action by the organization of lawyers called Client Earth. Um, and they took government to court on two or three occasions, two occasions, to get the, um, to get the government to even get to the stage of, of producing um, a strategy for dealing with NO2. The biggest issue, as I'm sure you all know, is that as a nation, we do not comply we do not comply with EU limits on, on, on nitrogen dioxide. And consequently, we're um, in breach of, of legal requirements. We have faced action um, by the European Union on this. The, we collectively have every right to expect um, that 
um, there should be a response from government, but it took legal action from client earth to get to that stage. So um, we have got a consultation. It's been out there for about six weeks. Today is deadline day for submission of responses. If any of you as individuals haven't submitted a response but would like to do so, you've got until midnight tonight. Um, go onto the DEFRA website, look at the consultation. You, there's somewhere in the order of about um, 10 questions. Um, feel free, if you'd want to just cut and, um, um, cut and paste from on what we've said collectively at CIH, feel free to do so. Um, but you know, please, please respond. Um, if, if you feel that you want to, it's not too late. So just quickly looking at what we've said in relation to that consultation. Um, we very, very firmly believe that the proposals set out in the consultation are wholly inadequate um, in terms of addressing what we said at the start is a national air quality emergency. Um, we believe that the proposals basically lack anything substantive they don't provide timescales for addressing the key challenges. Um, they don't provide clarity around targets. They don't really deal with the issues of, of resources to support actions. And then consequently, we take the view that these um, proposals do not amount to a strategic approach. They do not amount to a strategic approach. And simply what we're looking at here is, um, is a plan for a plan. That's all it is. But the big concern that we've got in all of this is when you go to the consultation, one thing leaps out at you all the time, and, and that is the government is consistently saying that they're looking to local authorities for to take novel solutions to this problem. Um, the view of our air quality advisory panel, the view of CIEH, and it's the view that we've represented in our responses, that is inappropriate. What we are dealing with here is a national emergency. A national emergency, we believe, requires a national response. To pass the buck, as government is doing, to local authorities, you know, 400 or so disparate local authorities across the length and breadth of this country um, is wholly inappropriate. This is a national problem. It requires national solutions. We can't end up with 400 or so different responses to this. It doesn't make sense. Pollution shows no is no respecter of boundaries. Pollution crosses all boundaries. We know that. And so consequently, um, the expectation should be that government should provide leadership on this and should be leading on it. Simple as that. What goes along with that, obviously, then, is um, if government is expecting um, that, 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 that collectively we respond to this as a nation, it should be prepared to put resources behind it. Um, frankly, money, it does matter here. Um, you can't achieve what we want to achieve, all of us want to achieve, in relation to air quality without resources. And certainly, if it's their intention, to look for local authority to implement um, strategies, to look to local authorities to deliver, then we know all know how tight things are at the moment um, in, in terms of local authority finance. Austerity has bit hard. And frankly, what we need to see are resources um, to back this up. Remember, go back to where we started, 40,000 premature deaths per annum and a cost to the state and to business of the order of 20 billion. On a cost-benefit analysis alone, this sort of demands the, the, the uh, allocation of resources. Um, what we've also said in, in our response on NO2 is that we have expressed some considerable concern about the central plank to the government's consultation, and that is clean air zones. The government seems to be holding up clean air zones as the panacea um, to this particular problem. Uh, and we take the view um, that it is far, far too early to do that. What we've got is that, that we've got five trial cities that are trialing clean air zones. 
and we're looking at, in some instances, we're not looking at implementation within those five trial cities till 2019. How then, in the, without implementation having taken place and without time to evaluate the effectiveness of the measures that are taken in, in those five cities, how can government hold up clean air zones as the solution? Um, our view is at the moment that, that clean air zones simply um, is, is something that is possibly worth pursuing, but we just don't know. Um, having said that, what we've also made plain in our response is that clean air zones in many respects are quite similar to air quality management areas. Air quality management areas, as you know, have been operational in this country for many, many years. There are somewhere in the order of 200 odd um, um, air quality management zones that are out there already and um, they've not worked and the evidence is that they've not worked is that they've not been rescinded. So I have to say to you if we know that air quality management areas haven't worked in respect of this issue clean air zones um, will require considerable, considerably more um, attention, more substance, more detail um, more proposals if we're going if they're going to be effective. Um, what we've also said in uh, in our response to government on this is, whichever way you look at it, the only real way to address this is to simply start remo removing the large numbers of older polluting di diesel vehicles on the road. And um, by that, we're specifically citing diesel trucks, diesel buses, diesel black cabs, but also older um, diesel cars, anything less than Euro 6 in standard. Or indeed, for that matter, um, Euro 3 for petrol as a standard. And we're saying that we seriously need to look at those number of those vehicles that are still on the roads. And if we're looking, if we're being serious about this issue of NO2, they need to, we need to start to re um, um, take measures to reduce or remove those numbers of vehicles. Um, surprisingly, some of you will have looked at this particular slide and said, what on earth is red diesel doing there? Well, we've put red diesel on there because as I indicated earlier, there is a consultation from government at the moment on red diesel. Um, some of you will be aware that, that the use of red diesel um, is limited. It's limited to agricultural use, um, but to uses in, in um, static engines, generators, but it's also of use, um, it can be used in refrigeration units on trucks. Um, red diesel carries a significant tax advantage, it's very cheap. The problem that we've got with red diesel being used particularly um, in refrigeration units on vehicles is that there are no restrictions whatsoever, none, on emissions from those um, engines, um, generating units, refrigeration units being powered by red diesel. And the estimates, um, certainly from London, is that there are 10,000 or so vehicles running around with red diesel powered um, refrigeration units every single day uncontrolled in terms of emissions, in terms of in terms of NOx, but also in terms of particulates. And it's been estimated that um, if we removed those 10,000, it would also be the equivalent of, re of removing 300,000 diesel powered cars. So you can see the issue of red diesel is significant and it's why it's on the slide in front of you. Finally, um, in terms of substance, um, what we're clearly calling for in the response that we've submitted to government is a new Clean Air Act for a new Clean Air Act. Um, the 1956, the 68, the 93 Clean Air Acts, frankly, were uh, acts of their time. Um, what we collectively, along with a whole host of other organizations are saying is um, those particular Clean Air Acts are no longer sufficient for dealing with current problems. We need a new Act of Parliament to address current issues and to provide us with a legal framework within which we can work, all of us work together 
um, to, to address this particular problem of, of air pollution. So that's a little bit more substance about what we've been saying to government, and certainly in respect, in respect to the uh, uh, submission on, on NO2 that we submitted yesterday. Um, but moving things along, um, what we've, uh, what I also just want to bring to your attention is a, a very couple, a couple of very, very brief um, case studies, um, and that is uh, that, that, that we've got information on, and I think you can see them on your screen right now. One's in London, one's in York. Um, for those of you who have read um, EHN of late, you'll have seen information about the York case study, um, but. We've been talking to colleagues in York, and we know that York's been doing an awful lot on, on issues of air quality. So is London, um, and there's some information there about what London and York are doing. The one thing that um, is not on that left-hand side, and perhaps should have been, uh, and it was certainly referenced um, in, in, in our submission to, to government in the NO2 response, is that um, TF, the TFL, Transport for London, um, in 2018, will not be taking new registrations of black cabs unless they're ultra low emission or indeed zero emission. Um, so um, that point I think perhaps should have been put there and I think that's an interesting one and um, and one of the things that we're saying is that, that that is a line that perhaps we would hope other local authorities would take in respect of black cabs. So you've got a couple of little case studies there. There are far more. There are more case studies on on our website. So if you want any more information about what other people are doing, what other local authorities are up to uh, in, in terms of air quality, and I know that that I, I don't wish to single anybody out, but we I do know that we're online today. We've got Claire Turbot from Plymouth. So Claire, thank you for all the information that you've provided us with about what Plymouth's up to. Um, on air quality, and um, we've been holding up Plymouth um, uh, as, as an undertaking some really good work, along with York and, and certainly colleagues in London. Um, and we'd love to hear from any of you out there who are working for organizations who are doing something really innovative and interesting on air quality. Um, and again, just before we bring this to a close, I'll tell you how to, to get in touch with us. To, to let us know about those sorts of things. So yeah, that's case studies, that's um, interesting. So moving along then, please, just to bring it to a close before we hand over to you in terms of questions, there are other resources that we've got there for you. Um, if you go to the website, www.ciih.org forward slash national clean air day and uh, .html, you can see that on your screen. What you'll find there is um, resources that range from videos through to the case studies, which I've just referred to. You'll also find information there about um, an air quality conference that we're holding here on the 12th of uh, July. Um, we've got some brilliant speakers lined up for that. Um, on, and the whole thing is going to be chaired by Lord Larry Whitty. For those of you who are a bit, perhaps a little um, longer in the tooth, um, some of you will remember Larry Whitty as the General Secretary of the Labour Party Cabinet, a member under Tony Blair, um, but Larry Whitty has agreed to chair that particular conference. We've got some great speakers there lined up, and um, please, um, and we would encourage you um, to have a look at that, and again, information on the website, and if at all possible, um, come along, book for it, and come along. You'll also find the resources um, after this webinar. You'll be sent a link of where you can actually see it all again, and that will be available um, from the website. So um, to bring this particular part of the webinar to a close, one final thing, if I may, and that is um, you will have seen we've been pushing the CIEH Excellence Awards for 2017, and we've pushed, been pushing them quite hard. And um, there is a specific award there for air quality, for people involved in air quality. Go to the website, again, ciih.org forward slash awards. Have a look at it. And please, if you've got, if, there are, if there's, you want to nominate your particular team, there's an award there for teams. There's an award there for air quality. Um, give it a go. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Nominate, nominate yourselves. Get others to nominate you, but please play a part. So that ends the formal, if you like, 
talk bit from me. Um, what we've now got are your questions. So I've got some lovely assistants here who are, who are fielding your questions and they're busy scribbling away, writing them down, pointing them to me. Um, I don't know who's, 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 who's um, presented these questions, but I've got a handful in my hands and um, let's just have a look at what, what you've been saying whilst I've been um, talking to you. So question number one, and again, thank you from whoever has submitted this. I haven't got a clue who it is, but does the CIEH agree that the current way we monitor air quality and look at improvements um, are inadequate, bearing in mind that the monitoring looks at residential facades rather than at pedestrians? Ooh, interesting one. Um, at the end of the day, we're the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. Um, what we are ultimately about is the health of the public. Um, in that sense, you know, we're interested in the health of individuals and the health of communities. And in that sense, I think it makes far more sense to at some part as part and parcel of a monitoring package not just to, to switch it but as part and parcel of a monitoring package to be able to look at the um uh, at, at the the if you like the air pollution dose that is being received by individuals um, pedestrians have used, as, as it's been put in the question but also cyclists people walking um people commuting choosing to walk to commute all all of those um, and in that sense, I'm going to hold up um, Plymouth again and, and what Claire Turbot and colleagues are doing there, developing, working with crowdfunding organizations to develop low cost personal air quality monitors, small and cheap personal air quality monitors that can be um, used by individuals and that then information can be fed back at real time to the local authority but also to the end user through an app and people then can start and make real choices about um, what, they're, what they're doing, when they're doing it, routes that they're following if they're cycling, routes that they're following if, when they're walking and can make real choices about reducing personal exposure. So um, I think I have to say to you that, that, that you know what we do need is more information, more monitoring data and what we need is a mix of that. But I also do feel that there is a, a place, a real place for personal dose monitoring to, to be undertaken. And feel free to, um, to contact Plymouth for more information about what they're doing in terms of developing um, personal um, uh, monitors. As I say, using crowdfunding um, in, in, in Plymouth. Um, second question, do we need to get the word local? removed from the process. Government have clearly stated it is a local authority responsibility, but this is a national issue requiring collaborative working across society. Totally agree. Whoever's put that one in, thank you for doing so. Um, yeah, totally agree. This is not a local matter. This is a national matter. And it's what I said right at the start, you know, to expect local authorities to field this, 400 odd local authorities across England, Wales, Northern Ireland and, and Scotland to deal with this issue, to deal with this problem um, and to have potentially you know, hundreds of disparate responses is not appropriate to a national emergency. The only way of dealing with this, as the questioner suggests, is, is collaboration collaboration from government at all levels, collaboration from government's agencies, collaboration from industry, collaboration from consumers, from planners, from traffic management specialists, um, from environmental health people, um, all of us together. But that requires a properly thought through, joined up strategic approach. And that's where You've already use, heard me use the phrase, government has abdicated its responsibility. So good question. Yeah, and I totally agree with what you said. Um, next question. And um, what is the CIEH view on energy from waste and the associated air quality impacts? Oh, interesting. So it's um, um, catch 22 almost on that. Yeah, you couldn't argue, um, I would think. 
um, about energy from wastes, uh, energy from waste, taking energy from waste. Absolutely, um, totally uh, supportive of that, and CIH has always been so. Um, let's also be clear. You know, when we're looking at combustion processes, um, it is possible, always possible, to manage, properly manage and control emissions from combustion process processes. We simply require the will to do so. And on that basis, and, and then sometimes the legislative framework to back it up. On that basis, yeah, energy from waste, good thing. Um, associated air quality impacts should be properly managed, is capable of being properly managed. There is a legislative frame framework there to deal with it under the Environmental Protection Act. Absolutely quite right. Um, and if we get it right, and as a technology develops, um, then you know the techniques, the best available techniques, if you like, um, the, um, will evolve, and we will be able to get tighter and tighter controls. Um, but let's also be clear: if we want to control emissions, it's in the, our scope to do so. It's a matter of will, and it's a matter of investment. Um, next question. If it is the EU who are imposing requirements that client Earth are litigating on, what happens with Brexit? Key question, and how do we keep it on the agenda or stroke high profile in two years' time? Um, brilliant question. Thank you for that one. Um, we take the view at CIEH that Brexit is a key issue for us, to the extent of which that over and above an air quality advisory panel and community, we've established a Brexit panel and community. And they've just started to do some work. Um, what we're really concerned about here is that um, as the country moves towards exiting the European Union, government has already said that the um, Great repeal, repeal Bill will simply transpose standards, transpose EU standards, um, into UK legislation, but we are very, very firmly of the view that that is only a short-term fix. It's only a short-term fix, um, and that the, we have to be clear what's to be done in the medium to long term. In the medium to long term, what we're looking for are very tightly defined standards, and CIEH is, as already said, and our, our advisory panel is agreed that at the very, very least, what we're looking for is the maintenance of EU standards post-Brexit, and where appropriate, we expect to see tightening of those standards. So um, our view is, um, yeah, Brexit will be important. Um, the view from government or some quarters in government and I reference particularly Ian Duncan Smith at the moment on this one. He's already talked about um, having a bonfire of regulations post-Brexit. Um, we profoundly disagree with that. There will be a lot of pressure to free up business, to free up business to maximise um, um, to maximise the impact of business on our gross uh, domestic product GDP. Um, because the impact of Brexit is going to be somewhere in the order of an 8% reduction in GDP by 2030. Um, government, therefore, in order to, to mitigate the impact of that, has to um, do what it needs to do to encourage business. What we're saying is, yes, do that, um, but not at the expense of the health of the wider environment or indeed of people. So totally agree. Brexit's a key issue. We want to maintain high standards, um, and we will be lobbying hard on that one using our Brexit advisory panel, using our supportive community over the coming uh, days and, and weeks. Um, moving on, yeah, and there's another question here on Brexit. Do you think Brexit might have any impact in government decisions regarding air, air pollution management? Yeah, I think I've covered that one already. Um, I don't think I need to do that um, anymore. Um, one final question. Um, which countries should we be looking 
to learn from, um, that have, perhaps have a cohesive strategic approach to addressing air quality. That's an absolute classic. Um, and to be honest, um, I think you caught me on the hop on that one. Um, to be able to point to a particular country, I don't know. You may know on that. You may know the answer to that far better than me. Um, I mean, I can go, frankly, I've been around the world um, and I've looked at other countries and what they're doing on some of these things. But I'm not aware right now of any individual country who I would want to hold up as, as having a cohesive strategic approach to addressing air quality. I can look at the Scandinavian countries and say that many of them have a cohesive strategic approach to transport. And in that sense, I can highlight them. I can highlight Finland, and I can highlight Sweden, I can highlight Denmark, and how they make transport work um, from a strategic, from a coordinated strategic point of view. And I can look at other parts of Europe and, and see that too. Um, I came back from Poland um, about a month or six weeks ago, and, um, and I, I'd been in Krakow, and, and you could see how the tram system in Krakow was completely integrated with the buses, completely integrated with the trains. Everything was done through a single ticket, and that single ticket also gave you options to use the equivalent of, of, of Boris bikes um, in, 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 in Krakow. So I can see countries having an integrated response to, to transport and hence air pollution, but you know you may be able to give, give point to us all to say, yeah, I'm aware of X or Y or wherever it may be that's, that's got a proper cohesive strategic approach to addressing air quality. Um, I think that's about all the time we've got right now. Um, if you're interested in joining the air quality community, please feel free to drop me an email. Um, if you're interested on finding out more about the work of our air quality advisory panel. Again, drop me an email. Um, if you're interested in Brexit, and I know we've mentioned that tangentially, again, drop me an email. My email address is t.lewis, t.lewis, at ceh.org. So feel free to drop me an email on any of those things. If you've got any comments on anything that we've done today, again, feel free to drop me an email. At the end of this, and we'll, as I say, we'll be done in a few seconds, you will be asked to complete a, a short survey on how you found today. And that would be really useful, please. I really do want to know um, what worked, what didn't work. Um, if you feel that we should have covered something that we didn't, um, let us know because we can always set up something again in, in, in a couple of months time and, and do a, a supplementary webinar or we can look at other ways of providing the information that you think you need that we haven't covered off on today. So um, in that respect, I think we're about done. Um, one final thing, one final plug from me and that is the air quality conference on the 12th of July. Um, so please have a look at it, have a look at the range of speakers that we've got on it, um, and if you can possibly come along to that, we'd really welcome you. So, thanks to you all, thanks for everyone for the, who put in questions, sorry we couldn't deal with all of them, um, time limited as all. I also want to thank my lovely assistants in the room, and particularly Sam Cleal, who's been sat to the right of me dealing with the technology. Um, but everyone else too that's played a part in making this webinar possible. Thank you to you all. Have a great day. It's also National Beer Day, would you believe? So go and celebrate beer whilst being, whilst thinking about clean air. So enjoy yourselves. Thanks a lot. Bye for now.